Greetings and welcome. Today we're completing our discussion of apartheid, of Nelson Mandela, and also of the relevance to racism and the history of racism in the United States. But let's finish the treatment of the apartheid system in South Africa. In the 1990s, internal protest and conflict in South Africa had led to an increasing recognition on the part of the ruling white government that economic stagnation and other forms of hardship in South Africa were making it harder and harder to sustain the system of apartheid. There was international pressure coming directly from the United Nations, from European countries, from the United States, and there were serious international sanctions, including uh, decisions to disinvest by numerous multinational corporations, which led to substantial economic hardship in South Africa. And so the governing party um, came to recognize that the system of apartheid was no longer sustainable. The national party, the governing party, the white supremacist, white minority uh, party, therefore decided to remove the hardline prime minister, P.W. Botha, and in his place, F.W. de Klerk became prime minister. De Klerk surprised all of South Africa almost immediately. In his um, acceptance speech, he announced substantial changes for South Africa. He announced the release of political prisoners, including Nelson Mandela. He announced legalization of the African National Congress and other racial justice organizations and he announced restoration of freedom of the press and other basic liberal freedoms. Nelson Mandela was released from prison in February 1990, and as we've mentioned before, in a stunning turn of events, Nelson Mandela was elected first Democratic president of South Africa and, of course, first black president of South Africa in 1994. As a result of these momentous decisions by de Klerk and his negotiations and, and eventually partnership with Nelson Mandela, many of the legal restrictions and the most important legal restrictions on black South Africans were removed. And so the legal system of apartheid was dismantled. But as maybe is not surprising, the informal kinds of discrimination and inequality which existed between white and black South Africans those inequalities persisted. Poverty, economic inequality, inequality of education and health, and other major disparities have persisted in the 26 years since the end of the apartheid regime. And so it remains a really serious and important question. Is it possible to create a peaceful, harmonious, equitable, democratic regime in South Africa or in other African countries with a long history of uh, white domination, is it possible to create a multiracial and equal democracy in, uh, in those countries? And so far, we have a long ways to go, or South Africans have a long ways to go. John Campbell is a commentator who's written extensively on uh, the apartheid regime and its aftermath, and he wrote a book called Morning in South Africa. In 2015, just five years ago, he wrote these words. With the end of apartheid in 1994, the people of South Africa anticipated profound social and economic change. Yet 21 years later, much of the population lacks access to proper medical care and education. Despite improved access to clean water, housing, and roads, many South Africans feel that too little has changed since the apartheid era. The Rainbow Nation is still racially divided in its electoral behavior, and the income gap between blacks and whites is greater than it was in 1994. Leading political figures in the ruling party, the African National Congress, ANC, are often accused of corruption. New political groups are calling for the nationalization and expropriation of land and resources from the white minority. Nevertheless, the Constitution enshrines the rule of law and has popular support across all racial divides. Are the laws and institutions in place since 1994 strong enough to preserve democracy and the rule of law 
when the pace of social and economic change remains slow? That is a crucial and existential question for South Africa in the future. And I hope as you move into the next phases of your education and into jobs in the future, you continue to pay attention to South Africa and continue to ask yourself the question, is South Africa progressing towards a racially just democracy? But I'd like to now turn to the question of racial discrimination in the United States, the history of racial discrimination which we have in this country, and how it could be compared to South African apartheid. Because there is a tendency for us Americans to underestimate the depth and extent and the current reality of racial discrimination in our country. During the Obama presidency, there was a common belief that, quote, racism is officially over in the United States. But in fact, the system of racial disadvantage and discrimination in the United States is profound and persistent. And that system has given rise to inequities that are impossible to reconcile with the idea of equality for all. A fundamental fact about American society is the persistence of disparities between African American and white populations. These disparities are manifest in the most important aspects of social life, income, wealth, education levels, health status, and incarceration rates. And several of these areas of disparity persist even when we control for income. Health disparities, for example, uh, persist between white and black adults no matter what income level. Most observers interpret these disparities as the continuing legacy of facts of racial discrimination and oppression, including the racial system of the Jim Crow South. But often we are not very able to see the mechanisms that perpetuate racial disparities in today's world. They're less visible, less, in some sense, uh, deliberate than they were in the 1940s and 1950s. This is a slide I prepared for a presentation to the Oakwood Health System a number of years ago on the topic of health disparities. And each of the component data slides shows the extent of disparities between white populations and black populations in Southeast Michigan. But if we were to make a, an inventory of the forms of past and present racial inequity in our country and in our state, we would think very quickly of a number of, of life-determining circumstances. First of all, residential segregation. Southeast Michigan is one of the most segregated, racially segregated parts of the country, and it has been since the 1950s. Second, unequal educational opportunities and outcomes. Because school systems are linked to residents, our country has not succeeded in providing equal quality education for children in every part of our country and every part of our states. Third, there are pervasive enduring health inequities across racial communities. And if you ever wanted to have a, a vivid idea of racial inequality, you should look at differences in infant mortality rates and mortality rates for elderly people and the um, dr dramatic differences which exist between infant mortality rates for white and black families and likewise at the other end of life, um, the um, gap in average longevity between white and black communities. These are just striking inequalities. And then finally, we would also notice inequalities in quality of housing. To this list, we should also add uh, inequalities in access to political voice. And it is a fact. It is um, a fact which has been studied by political scientists for the past 20 years that deliberate efforts have been made to reduce access to the vote to reduce political voice for African-American communities all around the country, including in our state of Michigan. There is also the fact of unequal treatment by the criminal justice system. Take almost any parameter that you might be interested in. Um, how are uh, teenagers accused of minor crimes treated in the court system, for example? And you will find that black teenagers and white teenagers are treated quite differently. Uh, on the topic of Black Lives Matter and the um, use of deadly force by police against young black men, the Washington Post 
created a database of police shootings since 2015, recording more than 5,000 deaths. It's a stunning number of deaths by police in that five-year period of time. And black persons are 2.4 times as likely to be shot and killed by police as white individuals, more than double the risk of being shot and killed as white people. Hispanic persons are 1.77 times as likely to be shot and killed by police as white persons. So a little more than double the rate and a little less than double the rate for black individuals and Hispanic individuals. The system of race in the United States is not um, an accident. It's not a coincidence. And in fact, um, I find it very important and very interesting to read a document that was written over 50 years ago. It's the Kerner Commission Report. Um, it's a report of the National Advisory Committee on Civil Disorders, which was commissioned by uh, President Johnson following the very destructive uh, civil disturbances which occurred in Newark, New Jersey, and Detroit, Michigan in 1967. The Kerner Commission was chaired by a former Illinois governor, Otto Kerner, and it, it is uh, striking to read the report. You can find it online for free. Uh, striking to read the report, um, not least because of the amazing level of honesty which it shows on the state of racial discrimination and racial disparities in the United States in the 1960s. Here's a quote from the report that I think is worth reading. Social and economic conditions, and this is describing conditions in Detroit and Newark and other major cities. Social and economic conditions in the riot cities constituted a clear pattern of severe disadvantage for Negroes compared with whites, whether the Negroes lived in the area where the riot took place or outside it. Negroes had completed fewer years of education or fewer had attended high school. Negroes were twice as likely to be unemployed and three times as likely to be unskilled and working in service jobs. Negroes averaged 70% of the income in earned by whites and were more than twice as likely to be living in poverty. Although housing, costs, um, housing cost Negroes relatively more, they had worse housing, three times as likely to be overcrowded and substandard. When compared to white suburbs, the relative disadvantage is even more pronounced. Um, this is a very um, damning observation about life conditions for African-American people in many cities around the country, including especially Detroit and Newark. They mention uh, 12 primary grievances of the young people, men and women, whom they interviewed and consulted with to try to understand what the underlying um, motivations were um, of the um, civil disorders which happened in 1967. And I, I'd like to name them. First, police practices and rough um, use of force by the police. Second, unemployment and underemployment. Third, inadequate housing, inadequate education, poor recreation facilities and programs, ineffectiveness of the political structure and grievance, grievance mechanisms. That's the first six um, grievances. Seven, disrespectful white attitudes, including language directed against young black, and, black men and women uh, by white policemen and persons in positions of authority. Eighth, discriminatory administration of justice. I referred to that just a few minutes ago inadequacy of federal programs, inadequacy of municipal services, discriminatory consumer and credit practices, and inadequate welfare programs. Each of these grievances is fact-based. These are the perceived um, uh, examples of racial discrimination and the effects of racial discrimination as perceived by the young and sometimes middle-aged African-American individuals who were interviewed by the Kerner Commission, but there is also good social scientific evidence to support that each of these um, grievances is in fact based in reality. What is most striking is how contemporary this list of grievances seems today in 2020. Let's turn now for a second to a very uh, famous um, African-American 
um, the Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall on the occasion of his being awarded the Liberty Medal. And he gave a speech, an acceptance speech in 1992 on the occasion of receiving the Liberty Medal, which is a very high honor to um, men and women who've made a major contribution to American society. Here are the comments which I wanted to quote from Thurgood Marshall. I wish I could say that racism and prejudice were only distant memories. Democracy just cannot flourish amid fear. Liberty cannot bloom amid hate. Justice cannot take root amid rage. America must get to work. In the chill climate in which we live, we must go against the prevailing wind. We must dissent from the fear, the hatred, and the mistrust. We must dissent because America can do better, because America has no choice but to do better. These words were expressed in 1992, 28 years ago, and once again, they are very, very timely. This could be a speech at a Black Lives Matter demonstration uh, five months ago. Justice Marshall's observation that racism and prejudice persists remains true today in the United States. Racial disparities persist in every important dimension of contemporary life, income and property, health, education, occupation, quality of housing, and life satisfaction. Let's turn to another important voice of African-American thinking and uh, experience of life in America. And this is the poet from the 1930s, the African-American poet Langston Hughes. These are both great images of, of Langston Hughes. Here's one poem which I think is very, uh, very relevant to our, um, our current topic of the, the persistence of racism and racial disadvantage in the United States. So this poem is called, Let America Be America Again, from 1935. And this is just the opening lines of the poem. It's uh, probably three times as long as these stanzas, but um, I, I will only read the opening lines. So here's the poem. Let America be America again. Let it be the dream it used to be. Let it be the pioneer on the plain, seeking a home where he himself is free. America never was America to me. Let America be the dream that dreamers dreamed. Let it be that great strong land of love where never kings connive nor tyrants scheme, that any man may be crushed by one, enough, one above. It never was America to me. Oh, let my land be a land where liberty is crowned with no false patriotic wreath but opportunity is real and life is free. Equality is in the air we breathe. There's never been equality for me, nor freedom in this homeland of the free. Say, who are you that mumbles in the dark? And who are you that draws your veil across the stars? I am the poor white, fooled and pushed apart. I am the Negro bearing slavery's scars. And the poem continues. It's a very powerful statement about race and class and inequality and power in the United States. So there is an important question for us in this course. Was the Reconstruction era in the United States and then the 50 years that followed in the South, was this actually, could we describe this as a form of apartheid? Was it similar in effect to the apartheid system which we've studied in South Africa? And in what ways did the ideology of white supremacy, the claimed superiority of the white race over the African-American race or the African race, uh, in what ways did the ideology of white supremacy guide both the construction of the apartheid regime and the direction taken by post-Reconstruction law and society in the American South after 1870? And what about the Northern cities? Did the extreme and socially and politically enforced segregation of northern cities represent a system akin to apartheid? Is Eight Mile Road itself an apartheid boundary in Metro Detroit? There are lots of ways of trying to answer these questions, but here is one set of answers that I've tried to formulate. First, the American system of race is not and was not exactly the same as apartheid. These, these systems of race were different. 
Both systems derived from an ideology of white supremacy and an associated fear of full democratic rights for millions of black and uh, black citizens and other communities of color. So fear of a system representing full democratic rights for black citizens was in common. Both systems created profound inequalities across racial groups and great deprivations of human well-being and human fulfillment. And we saw that in apartheid, but we know it also from the experience of race and racial inequalities in this country. Both systems depended, often in different ways, on violence and the threat of violence to maintain themselves. But the United States did find its way towards greater equality and dignity through democratic struggle. The Civil Rights Movement, Dr. King, LBJ, the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, and a continuing struggle for equality. And if we take seriously all the forms of racial discrimination and, and disadvantage, which I've mentioned in the past few minutes, then we know that struggle is not over. But it is also very clear that in this country, we have been able to make democratic progress in the direction of greater equality.